Hello, everyone. Hello, and welcome to Pomona College. It's a real pleasure to have all of you here for a conversation between Professor of Neuroscience, Nicole Weeks, and Michael J. Fox. Let me say a few words about each of them. Nicole Weeks is a member of the Pomona College faculty since 1999. She received her bachelor's degree in psychology at Boston University, both her PhD and postdoctoral fellowship in behavioral neuroscience at UCLA. Her research involves individual and group differences in stress responses, focusing both on how the brain and body code stress and how they're affected by that stress. Nicole has won three Pomona College Whig Distinguished Professor Awards for Excellence in Teaching, and she was named in 2003 the California Professor of the Year by the Case Carnegie Foundation and is on the Princeton's review list of the top professors. Our second guest really needs no introduction. I'll just say a few words. On the big screen, small screen, as an inspiring writer and as a tireless activist, Michael J. Fox has left an indelible mark. There are Golden Globe and Emmy Award ro winning roles to remember. The endearing conservative Alex P. Keaton on Family Ties. Time traveling Marty McFly on Back to the Future. Deputy Mayor Mike Flaherty on Spin City and the always cunning attorney, Lewis Canning, on The Good Wife. But the role that far surpasses those characters is Michael J. Fox, fighter. Since his public disclosure that he had early onset Parkinson's disease, Michael has made what could have been a private struggle into a collective cause, standing at the very forefront of the charge to find a cure. Today, the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research is the world's largest nonprofit funder of Parkinson's drug development. Michael is single-minded in his quest to eliminate Parkinson's disease in our lifetime. If you read his book, A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Future, Twists and Turns and Lessons Learned, you will notice a few things. First, Michael is unflinchingly realistic. Control is illusory, he says. No matter what university you go to, no matter what degree you hold, if your goal is to become master of your own destiny, you have more to learn. This is a sobering truth that sometimes we are quick to ignore or deny. This isn't something we like to hear at any stage in life, not when you're a student, not when you're a parent, not as a college president. But we would be wise to remember that none of us have any future guarantees. But Michael is also relentlessly hopeful it's catastrophe that offers the most promise for an even richer life, he writes. This is the gateway to the good stuff. In times of inevitable adversity and disappointment, we would be equally wise to remember those words. Hardship is not an ending, but a beginning. Michael has shown us that. Michael is not just an iconic actor and loving father. He is also a visionary leader with much to teach us. Please join me in welcoming Michael J. Fox and Nicole Weeks. Imagine how I feel. <laughs> so um, let me start out by saying um, what an honor, a true honor it is oh, to um, be able to share this moment with you. Um, you're one of my very favorite actors and certainly one of my very favorite humanitarians. So oh, thank, thank you, you so much for being here with us. My pleasure. I sort of lived up to all this. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I thought I would structure our discussion um, similarly to the way you structure your book, Always Looking Up. So I figured we'd talk a little bit about work and a little bit about politics and a little bit about faith and about family. But I also figured given where we are, we probably should talk a little bit about education too. Sure, I'm, I'm, as anybody who's read my books knows, I'm an expert in education. Yes, I, I, I mean, wasn't great education. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a cautionary tale that, is, that, that worked out wrong. 
I left school in the 11th grade and I moved, sold my guitar and moved to California to be an actor and it worked. <laughs> I had a hard time telling my kids, you know. But luckily, oh. luckily they're good students in their own right. So. <laughs> so we'll definitely talk more about that. Um, so I thought I would start with work and here's my question. And that is um, when I was talking to my students about having the opportunity to possibly ask you a question. One of my students almost jumped out of her chair, and this is what she said. She said, oh my gosh, Michael J. Fox is my obsession. I grew up watching his movies. I love him beyond anything I can imagine. And the weird thing about that was that I thought to myself, wait a minute, I grew up in love with Michael J. Fox. <laughs> So here's my question. How is it possible that a 20-year-old and an almost 50-year-old were both obsessed with you growing up? I don't know how it's possible anyone was obsessed with me growing up. <laughs> I wasn't obsessed with me growing up. I don't, I, I don't know. Back to the Future is, is a really remarkable thing. And um, I mean, fam family ties was very popular and, 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 and it's funny, I worked with a writer, a younger writer, well, everybody's younger now, but he said, he said, um, I, I grew up watching reruns of your show, and I, I said, yeah, like, I grew up watching reruns of Gilligan's Island. It's, it's, it's like, yeah, it's hard for me to think of it in that, that frame, and it was 30 years ago, 35 years ago, but, um, but I guess, I guess, I, I have to think it's back to the future, it just, yeah. it's, it's become perennial, it's become uh, uh, like Wizard of Oz was when we were kids. That's and, and we'd see it on TV once a year, and if there was no cable and no playback and no DVR, you saw it when, when it came on, and it made a bent out of it. And, um, and I think that people treat that movie the same way. I think that's right. It was, it was really a remarkable thing going through the, uh, the anniversary of when Marty arrived in the future, and we actually got to that date. And, um, uh, and, and I got all the inevitable questions about what, what has transpired and what hasn't transpired, what, what they predicted and what they didn't predict. They predicted the Cubs would win the series, that didn't happen. Uh, they predicted there'd be hoverboards, and we had plenty of hoverboards, there's those little things that catch on fire. <laughs> uh, I mean, our hoverboards didn't, didn't spontaneously combust, so. <laughs> but uh, but it's, it's been an amazing year, and the, the biggest thing I've learned from it was how deep these things, these co common cultural experiences that we have, how they resonate for years and years and years, and 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 the and the, and the, and the accidental uh, beneficiaries of that are those of us who were involved in it, and and um, and we're lucky enough to be, to be a part of it. And I told them they, they put this mic on me, and I said, I move constantly. <laughs> so, so good luck. <laughs> and I think it's all right. Is that okay? Time life operator. <laughs> Okay, I have a related question about your career. We can change the mic if we need to. Um, a related question is, you've been acting for so long, right? Since 15? Since 15, yeah. 15, yeah. So um, how has the work changed you, and how have you changed the work? Well, when I first started, I was just a goofy kid. I was just, I just, I, my interests were all in, in, in the arts, in, in music, I played in a band, and, and, I, and I, play, I did art, drawing, graphic design, and, and, uh, and, I, and I acted in, in all the school productions, and, and I just, that just was the most accessible way, way to, to express my creativity. I didn't need anything, I, I could just, I just uh, tell a story, and, um, and I, I, really, I really liked it, and I, I started working a lot in Canada, and, and, and eventually met some people through an American production I did in Canada and, and, and moved to the States and got an agent and did all that stuff. Um, but but it, it was with Family Ties and, and, and Onward that, I, that it became more, more of an internal experience than, than an external experience. I wasn't doing it for people, I was doing it for me all of a sudden. And, 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 and when it, it became a financial imperative tied to it that I had to get work, I realized that I wasn't getting work because I was so good and they didn't see it. I wasn't getting work and it wasn't good enough yet. And, and, and so I, I, I worked on it and, and, um, and eventually work came. And, and in, a, in a broader scope, um, I think what, what 
What works in action is when you stop watching yourself. You can get out of that thing of watching yourself and, and just and just be it. And so I mean, I, I got that at a certain point in my career. But when I get with Parkinson's, it, it made me it made me have a, to whole, do the whole thing over again, and and realize that that um, that what I couldn't do was was more freeing than what I could do, because what I could do, I I, I was I was. Uh, awestruck by, by all the amount of choices I had and, and could I make all these choices and was I making the right choice? And, and when you can make the only choice you can make, which is I can't pick up that glass because if I do it'll spill, um, then it kind of makes things easy for you. So you're the guy who didn't pick up the glass. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, I, and I realized that, 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 um, that I can play anybody as long as he has Parkinson's. That's it. <laughs> So I have to ask you, it's not really a follow-up, but it seems to me you haven't experienced a lot of professional rejection, but I do remember a story in one of your books, and it involves a pioneer chicken yeah. and a phone booth. And I'm wondering if you might be willing to share that Sounds with the audience. Sounds like a scene, doesn't it? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I was, when, I, when I was, um, I actually did have a lot of rejection when I first came to the States in the first three years, I, I, I lived in a uh, series of kind of shady apartments and, and, and was eating plain wrap macaroni and plain wrap tuna and, and, and unfortunately using most of my food money for cigarettes. I mean, I was, I was 23 and pretty stupid. And, um, and I, I, got, I went to this audition for, 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 family, tie, for family Ties and Gary Goldberg, the, the, the producer and the creator just passed away recently. He was a great man. And he, he, um, he saw me audition and, and hated me. Just thought I, I was the worst kid he ever saw. And, he, and he, he really wanted Matthew Broderick and Matthew Broderick didn't want to do it. And, and I was used to, to chasing after Matthew Broderick's scraps. Like I, I, I was this close on war games. <laughs> And and, um, and so I, I, I and I'll do it, but he didn't want me to do it. And, and the casting director Judith Weiner uh, prevailed upon him to see me again. And he said, "Judith, I'm a grown man. I know what I like, and I don't like this kid." But she said, "See him again." And, and I came in, and somehow everything lined up, and I, and I gave a reading that he got and he liked. I, I didn't feel it was that much different than the first time, but but he, after a moment of realizing Matthew Broderick was not coming anytime soon. <laughs> I, I, his, 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 his opinion expanded, and um, uh, so so I got the job, and, and then, the, then the problem was um, I negotiated a contract, and, and I, I had no money, and and uh, I had no phone, I had no I had no furniture. I sold my sectional couch section by section to a guy in the our building, and um, and I was negotiating a deal for for family ties in, in a in a paid phone. In a phone booth outside of Pioneer Chicken, because uh, that that would then become my office. <laughs> I had no phone, so that was where I, I did my deal. So I'm, I'm doing the deal in in the thing, wishing I had a buck ninety nine to go in and buy a biscuit and wing combo. <laughs> so so that was that was the beginning of, of of my. I mean, once I got with Family Ties, it's just it's just been a, it's just been a great ride ever since. Absolutely, absolutely, a great ride for us too. Um, so here's my question. What is the most important thing you learned from Superman? And in this case, I mean Christopher Reeves. Oh, uh, Christopher was, I mean, we knew him a little bit before his accident. We didn't, we didn't know him well, but we, we socialized with he and, and his wife, and, and they were such nice people. And, and then shortly after, we heard about his accident. and um, and. You, you feel so uh, uh, sorry and, and sad, and, 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 and you, you, you really uh, feel for, for the family and young kids. And, um, and, and, and also, an actor uh, robbed of his, his, his ability to, to, to communicate, at least it. it, it uh, it seems as though he was robbed, but but then but ultimately he taught us 
so much with, with, with his perspective on his paralysis and his, uh, and, and you would see him, you know, with that breathing apparatus and just struggling and yet, and yet he, 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 he was taking pleasure in the fact that he could still express himself and he, and he had a point of view and he, he was, one, he's the first guy that I heard about stem cells from and, and, um, and it was so tragic that he, he passed and Dana passed and, and uh, uh, but but I learned, I learned, what, I mean, it sounds corny, but, but what a superman he was, what a, what a strong, what, willed uh, warrior, and, and he taught me that you could, you could do more with blink of eyelids and, 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 and coin a phrase, turn a phrase, than, than, than he could with all the expression that, that, that a full, a fully able body would permit him. He just was, he was just a stunning guy to know. Absolutely. Uh, so I want to get back to the stem cells in just a moment, but I want to make sure I don't forget to say that it seems like he was quite helpful to you in terms of starting the foundation. Um, but I'm not sure everyone in the audience knows, I didn't know this, that the Michael J. Fox Foundation has raised, is it 400 and Fifty million dollars yeah, for Parkinson's research. So I just want to take this moment to acknowledge that. Yeah, it's it's amazing. We have we've had a lot of great support. We we have uh, uh, great support from uh, Sergey Brin, who's really uh, he uh, has an interest in his mother has Parkinson's, and, mm -hmm. um, and he may through research we've done, he may be uh, genetically. Predisposed, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, it's been an amazing thing. We've, we've become the se second largest funder of Parkinson's research in the world after the federal government, and, and 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 ours is focused. Uh, there there's, tends to be more general. I always say, if you want a grant from the NIH, go and tell them that you think the world is round and you want to prove it, and they'll <laughs> give it to you because then they'll, then they'll say, what, what, what the grant that was, and you came back and proved your point. It is round. Um, but it's uh, it's been it's been uh, really uh, a humbling experience, and and you talk about Chris, Chris was an inspiration to me, and and, and uh, uh, Lance uh, Lance Armstrong, Lance Armstrong was uh, was also an inspiration, and, and, and I mean all that we know that has transpired and everything that happened, notwithstanding, when I first uh, spent some time with him, it was in Paris during the Tour de France. We just happened to be there. And he had all these folks come, follow him, that, that were cancer patients and, and their families. And, and it, the sense of community there was really inspiring to me, that, that, that the, the connection they all had to each other and, and, and the connection that, that Lance, I think, sincerely had with them. Um, again, notwithstanding all the other stuff that went on in his life, it just really impressed me. And, 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 and I was just experiencing a similar thing with with people responding in the Parkinson's community, responding to, to what I was going through. And I was realizing I was part of a community and, and had a unique opportunity, to, to a real privilege to, 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 to be in a position where I, could, I might be able to advance uh, uh, support for research. And, and, um, and I'd always be grateful to those two guys for, for, for their uh, inspiration. And can we talk a little bit then about stem cell research and sort of where it has come and um, what you see in, in the future? Well, I, I got involved in the stem cell uh, issue again, it, being inspired by, by uh, Chris and then learning more about it. And I, and I, went, to, I went to testify in, in front of Congress about the need for funding for Parkinson's research and, and, and spoke to a, another doctor who, who said that with stem cell research, that, that, that it's a possibility there could be a cure within five to ten years, and and that perked up my ears. I mean, it, it really got my attention, and I, and I thought we, we need a concentrated effort uh, on on research, and, and I decided to start a foundation that was at least initially for solely interested in research, and and uh, 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 there were other organizations that were handling quality of life and and other issues and political issues and. So, uh, long story short, I was I was testifying, and, and I got this information, and and um, and then I, I 
I, I got excited about stem cell research, and then I heard that that uh, George Bush's uh, uh, administration was not going to let it go forward. Was not going to uh, allow any federally funded uh, researchers to, to use embryonic stem cells, and that and that meant like the whole they would shut down funding for, for the whole whole program for the whole school. And, and so, it, I mean, it just, there was no, in, it, it just choked off the, the research. And my point was about scientific research freedom, uh, research, uh, not, not, not choking off research before it proves something, if, if something is promising and, and, and there's, there's this possibility that it could change lives, uh, um, we should go for it. And, and what, what further bothered me was, from a political point of view, was, was how kind of half-hearted the 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 the, the, the uh, opposite side uh, uh, were um, there was this the same I mean our point was that uh, through in vitro fertilization there are there there are vats of, of unused frozen embryos that they were never going anything that was going to happen to them other than they were going to get washed down the drain mm -hmm. and and we said well there's there's possibility in there because they're pluripotent cells they could be anything that we could create dopamine producing cells or, or or as I'll discuss in a second, insulin producing cells, uh, or all kinds of things. And, and, um, and, and they would say, well, we have snowflake babies. People are going to adopt the, the frozen embryos, and then we call them snowflake babies. And it was such a uh, kind of a George Bush thing to say. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> okay. Snowflake babies, let's make it a euphemism and, and, and we'll sell it that way. And, and they just like, we're talking about people's lives. You know, you're talking about snowflake babies. I mean, great, there's the, the room for snowflake babies and, and, and groundbreaking medical research. Um, and so I, 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 I spoke up, it was, a, it was an election year and I, I got involved with Claire McCaskill's campaign. And, and, um, and she was really brave to, she was in a tough race. And she was in a, 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 a red state and, and she was first trying for first term. And, and she asked me to do a, just an ad on stem cells, so I did. And um, Rush Limbaugh wasn't happy. <laughs> and and, he, and he, he made a point of going on, on air, and he has a television simulcast. And he uh, uh, imitated my gestures. Yes, he did. Which, yes, it, he did. which, um, which somebody else just did. Donald just did. <laughs> Another guy. That's a popular move with a certain crowd. And, and, and I wouldn't, people ask me if I was offended. I wasn't offended. I just, I just thought, well, this I really pissed them off. This is really something they, they don't like that, 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 that when they're trying to drive a message during a campaign that, that, that I'm talking about stem cells and they don't want to talk about stem cells. And, and I realized, I started to understand what wedge issues were and, and how, I mean, it was my political education that, that if, if you are someone who believes in research freedom, that's probably five on your list or six or seven on your list. It's, it's up there, it's important, but it means it's not gonna drive your decision. But if you're against embryonic stem cell research, it's like number two on your list, or number one on your list. And, and so they, they, they get quite uh, intense about it. And um, uh, the, 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 the opposite shot of it is that, that stem cell research, as it relates to Parkinson's, has met some snags. Because uh, for, for one thing, uh, you, you, you have to get it in the brain somehow, stem cells into the brain, whether it's by virus or trophic factors or, or whatever, you have to find a way to get it in by brain barrier. And once it's in there, you, we've created dopamine producing cells, that's not a problem. Um, but but you can't, we can't monitor their growth and we, can't, and we haven't found a way to, to, to make sure that they don't grow into cancerous uh, t tumors or growth we, we're not, we don't want. But it, it, in the papers the other day, there was, there was a piece about, about uh, how stem cells are being used to treat uh, type 1 diabetes patients. They, 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 they found a way to, to put uh, insulin producing stem cells that, that they created from embryonic stem cells and in, in, a, in a kind of a capsule and they close it in, into the circulatory system and, and it will let enough out to, 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 to heal the pancreas 
and, and, um, and at the same time be in there regenerating, in a capsule regenerating. And so, and, and, and effectively think that within five to 10 years that they will have cured type 1 diabetes. So that's research freedom. You, you, you know, I, I mean, it, it didn't, it didn't uh, work out for us in the short term, it may in the long term. But but it, it it's working out for other other uh, other diseases and other and other research uh, missions. So so I, I, in the, in the end I'm I'm quite proud of my 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 work for that. Absolutely. You brought up Donald Trump. I did not. I just want to say that. <laughs> so I'm not going to ask you about Donald Trump. I am going to ask you though about universal health care. Yeah, I, I, I'm not an expert on insurance, and I, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't know a lot about politics r around it. I tend to be in favor of a single payer system because I'm from Canada. Yeah. That's my experience. That's what I grew up with, and, and I just uh, I don't understand anyone not getting medical care. I, I think, it, uh, especially uh, given the amount of resources that are available and. and, and I mean, I've been to the Hamptons in New York. I've seen <laughs> the yachts and the resources available. <laughs> I mean, someone could kick a little in. Um, so I, 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 I just think that I think that we just need to we just need to find a way that everyone gets coverage. And and and, and I, I I think that now the thing is to build on what we have. I think President Obama made great gains, and I think I I don't think we should scrap it. I think we should build on what we have, but with a goal toward. Whether you call it single payer, whatever you call it, just 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 that like someone who's diagnosed with Parkinson's at 32 or 33 doesn't have to lie about it and and and, and you know steady his hand as he reaches for his cup of coffee uh, and for fear that his boss is going to notice and and, and 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 it's all going to be over. That's just uh, that's all, you know well it was my experience, but but um, but there's all kinds of iterations of that. That, that go on, and, and, and it's, just, it's just unconscionable that, we, that everyone can't get care. Amen. Amen. So since we're here on Family Weekend, um, I want to switch over to family a bit. And I wanted to ask you if you could tell us where you were on 9-11 and where you were on 9-14. <laughs> you read my books. <laughs> That's my job, man. <laughs> uh, on 9-11, I was here. I was here in LA. Uh, uh, I'm not here it is in LA, but I was in LA, California, and um, and my family were all back east in, in New York, and, and including Tracy, who was who was uh, pregnant at that time, and uh, was my youngest daughter, and um, and she called, and it was, uh, it was like five in the morning. What if it was 5:45 in the morning, and and I said, "What's what's happening?" And she she described the plane hit the first tower, and it immediately it didn't sound good to me. And and so I I, I was talking to her, and I said, "You should start thinking about where the kids are, because the kids are at school, and and how you can get them home." And and um, and she 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 uh, she said, "Yeah." And then, and then the second tower hit, and then we knew it was all it was all going south in a hurry. And um, I, now people have had, people I know, and, and, and certainly thousands of others have been affected by this in, in the most immediate personal way. I mean, you lost people, and, and, and I, 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 I lost people that I knew, and not anyone that was really close to me. So, so I don't mean to tell the story like it's what happened to me during 9-11, but, but um, I, I, it told me something about it. It taught me something being a father that, that I didn't understand, which was when she said that, I said, I'm, I'm coming back. And then I called, and all the airlines were closed down. There were no private flights, and there was nothing. There was no way to get back. So I got in a car and, and, and went back and, um, and, and made it in less than two, less than two days. Um, and, and I remember being, being in New Jersey and seeing the city and seeing seeing what wasn't there, I had a good view of what wasn't there, and I had a good view of the smoke. And I called my wife and I said, I'm almost home, is, it, is there anything that I can do? And she said, yeah, get some bread. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
And I mean, there's moments like that that just teach you what, like how you, you have no idea what you're involved in when you're involved in a family and, and, and you love them and they love you and, and it just becomes, uh, it just becomes the, the center of everything, yet it, it radiates out so that it affects your, the way you deal with other people and the empathy you have for other people's situations and, and the patience you have with other people because you, you have the patience with yourself and with your children. Um, and, 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 and they just mean so much that, that, that the most daunting obstacle can't, can't keep you from, from being there for them and with them. I love that story. Thank you. Um, not only is it family weekend, but it's also Valentine's Day weekend. My husband's someplace in here, so <clears throat> don't forget that. Um, My wife always says, don't, don't get me anything, don't get me anything. And it's like, <laughs> Yeah, the famous last word. Yeah, that's right. That's, don't, don't forget that. Don't forget that. Um, so when you think about your wife, Tracy Poland, actress Tracy Poland, what are the three words that come to mind? Funny, sexy, and patient. That's worth some yeah. chocolate and flowers. That's amazing. Honey, you heard that, right? I like that answer. OK. Um, how about this? So, what about your children? And this is specifically what I want to ask you. And that is You're about cut off. your. <laughs> I think the bar closes early yeah. today. <laughs> um, so, your parenting style. So, two things from your writings come to mind for me. One is, are we there yet? Yeah. And the other is, some lady had a baby in a tree. Yeah, that's, 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 that's my favorite. Could you explain why those are part of your parenting style? I, I have, I have uh, three daughters and a son. My son is older. He has no guilt in this. But my, my, my daughters are, are, I mean, they're, they're, they have, things are important to them that I don't understand. <laughs> I mean, who's got the brush? Who's wearing what? Uh, just, just all kinds of stuff, and I, I don't, I don't, I don't know how to do that. Other than, other than I've said to people, when, when my son went to college, I, I, I got a big dog named Gus, a big male dog, because I was drowning in the sea of estrogen, <laughs> and 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 I needed, I needed some release. So, so, uh, and, and the other thing I learned is when, when, when you hear your, your your wife and your daughters arguing, don't go in there. Because you're only going to get hurt. Because <laughs> they'll turn on you like so quickly. It's kind of like they say with police, the most dangerous call is a domestic disturbance call. It's the same thing with in the house. Just if, the, if Tracy and the kids are, or the girls are arguing, just stay clear. <laughs> um, so when, in, when, when they come to me with this stuff, I, I, this, this is more like five, six years ago, seven years ago, when they were all younger. And, um, and they'd come to me with these things, and I would just wouldn't know how to answer them. So I found a thing in the New York Times, an article about a woman in, in uh, uh, the name of the country's gone out of my head, but in Africa. Uh, and and um, she, she, her village had been flooded, terrible floods. And it was one of those things you see on TV where it's just awful, it's torrential flooding, you know, sweeping up animals and livestock and buildings and, and people and, and, and um, it's just an awful thing. And what had happened was a lady had been swept up in it, a young woman, and she was pregnant. And she somehow managed to, to grab a tree branch as she was being carried at a, at a raucous pace uh, seaward. And, and she grabbed onto this tree and climbed up in it and, and actually delivered her baby. And, and she was rescued uh, some hours later with, with nursing the baby. Um, and and uh, uh, the umbilical cord was still attached, but it was really, it was really remarkable. So now I, I say to my kids, whenever they come to me with issues, um, no matter, and you can use this yourself, I say, a lady had a baby in a tree. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you got? And, 
and so Sam and I wanted to go on a trip uh, by ourselves, just a guy bonding thing. And, and, and we invited a friend and, and his two kids to come with us. And Tracy flew with the babies to California. And the reason she did that was we were going to go on an 18 uh, day journey across from, from New York to, to uh, Malibu. And, um, and so it was a great trip. And it was just everything. I mean, it was all, we stayed at Yosemite and, and, um, and Grand Canyon and we saw Mount Rushmore. We did the whole thing. And, and then we, um, we stopped in Vegas and I saw the Tyson fight where Tyson bit his ear off. That was, that was another side story. I, Sam said to me, can you go to the fight? And I said, hey, you can't go to the fight. I'll, I'll have a babysitter for you. Yeah, you can't, can't get you in the fight. He said, this is a good fight. And I said, it's a great fight because it's actually a good guy against a bad guy. You can, you can cheer for, for a guy who, who, uh, who was pretty good and cheer against a guy who was pretty bad. And he said to me the next day, how was the fight? And I said, you know the guy I said was a bad guy? <laughs> he was really bad. <laughs> he tried to eat a guy. <laughs> but, but anyway, the... the, the well, are we there yet? Um, so we, we, at a certain point in that, this goes back to my dad being uh, uh, a real tough guy. My dad was in the military, and we used to get transferred across the country, across Canada. So we'd have to drive across Canada every couple of years to, to a new posting. And we, had, we couldn't afford hotels, so we had a big tent, a big green army tent. And we would go to Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, or wherever we were going on our way across the country, and we'd pitch a tent. And and stay there for the night, and then pack up the tent the next day and go. And, um, and my father, one thing he, he hated, well, two things he hated. One was if he had to stop and go to the bathroom. He hated that. He just couldn't, he just, he just drowned in it. <laughs> and the you know, only hope would be to get my mother to drink more coffee in the morning so she'd have to stop, because he wouldn't say anything if she had to stop. So I'd say, oh, Mom, do you have to go? And so anyway, so he hated that, but he hated, even more so he hated, are we there yet? And he would say, he'd say, you know, am I driving? Are we pitching a tent? No, we're clearly not there yet. <laughs> Enough. And, and, and I was amazed on this trip across the country that, that with these kids that, that they had never said that. And, and, uh, and then one day we were, we were driving through, I think it was like Death Valley. It was, I mean, it was a kind of big pl flat place with a lot of um, scrub and, and, and it was, there was nothing anywhere around. And my son goes, are we there yet? <laughs> and I said, are we there yet? Just a second. And I, and I, and I, I thought, I'm going to do something different than what my dad did. So I pulled over to the side of the road, and I, and I, I, got, I opened my son's car door, and, and I, I said, get out. And you tell me, are we there yet? <laughs> you go and investigate the situation, and you let me know if you think we're there yet. <laughs> and so the other two kids got out of the car, and, they, and I said, Check it out. Are we there yet? That's what we're trying to find out if we're there yet. And, and I mean, it's like sagebrush is whistling down. The, and, 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 and after about five minutes, they, uh, one of the kids found a, a feather and one of the kids found a rock or something. And, and Sam found, found like a petrified coyote turd. Or something. And I said, yes, we are, we are here now. And we're going to get in the car and then we'll be going to the next place. And we'll know when we get there. And so that was my answer. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So in a couple moments, we're going to switch over and let the students ask a couple of questions. But I just want to follow up on that. My follow up is this: Are you there yet? I, I don't. I don't think so. I mean, it's. It's the, the, the interesting thing about having a disease that keeps you constantly moving is that yeah. you're constantly moving. Yeah. Yeah. And I have to be, have to be uh, comfortable with that. Yeah. I don't have to be comfortable with that, but I, I become comfortable with that. And every, every day teaches me new things. And, and so to the extent that I, I don't feel that I've learned all the stuff I'm going to learn, yeah. Yeah. Um, just like when they got out of the car and looked at stuff, there's stuff to find and then to move on and find the next stuff. Yeah. And, and um, I've been blessed to, to, to be, to be uh, in, in incredible situations as, as, as a parent, as a, as a, a husband, as, as an actor, as a producer, as, as an advocate. And, and every, I mean, I wake up every day and say, what's up? 
<laughs> what's going on? And I tell a story in in, uh, in being a lucky man. Now being a, uh, I was looking up. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. My book title. I can remember it. <laughs> Um, that, that, that I, when I get up in the morning, my, my feet are cramped, and I shuffle, and, I, and I'm in danger of falling down, and, and I, I, I have to put on hard shoes to get my feet to conform, and it's just in the morning, it sucks. And, and uh, I go and brush my teeth, and I, I have an electric toothbrush, it's just, it, but I don't have an electric toothbrush. <laughs> and, and, and I'll go and get in the shower, and I'll kind of be all kind of crumpled up, and I'll sit on my little bench, and water will come down, and I'll wash my hair and, and, and get out and, and, and get dressed and, and walk out of my part of the bedroom where I dress and, and there's a full mirror there and I'll look at myself all kind of crumpled up and rumpled and shaking and wet and miserable looking and I'll say, what are you smiling at? <laughs> and so I, 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 I the smile is there with it, no matter what goes on and it's, it's, I think that's one of the reasons why I was diagnosed 26 years ago, and they told me I'd have 10 years left to work, and um, and, and and it was just a, an emphasis. I think of a lot of things. I have a good friend who, who had lymphoma, and 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 people and years ago, and people say, "How did you? How were you cured of cancer?" And she said, "I have cancer. I wasn't cured of cancer. I still have cancer. I just I'm living with cancer. I'm not dying from cancer." And 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 that's. That's the, that's the key, is, is just that whatever these things, what's going to happen is going to happen. But, but the time in between, I, mean, I couldn't spend time as a 22-year-old thinking about being a 54-year-old that, that was in a wheelchair or, or couldn't walk. I, I, it never occurred to me to think that. So, so if, it, if it comes, I mean, like I say, if you, if you imagine the worst-case scenario and it actually happens, you've lived it twice. So... By not projecting into the future as to what I would, where I would be now, I believe I've, I've played a game on it. And, and, I've, and, I've, and, I, and I'm, I'm in a much better place than I was when I was 23, 21, when I was diagnosed, uh, 29, um, 26 years ago. It, 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 it's, it's that not projecting into a grim future that, that, that has, has made my, my, my presence so, so wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm I just want to say I'm so incredibly inspired by you. And I know a lot of our students are as well. So I want to give them a few minutes to ask you a few questions right. as well. Yeah? Keep it clean. <laughs> I wish you'd said that before. <laughs> Hi there. My name is Tim Hernandez. I'm a junior at Pomona. And the question that I had was, so given your experience supporting Parkinson research, have you ever had any friction with the pharmaceutical industry? industry? You know, it's interesting. With the pharmaceutical industry, uh, you know, I, we, we kind of approached them warily at first because we didn't really know what to expect. And, and, and we all know the, 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 the sins of drug companies and... and Price inflation and, and 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 among other things, uh, but we found that one of the best things to do was to work with them, and to get them to see things our way. And and, and, and by doing that, I mean one of the things we do uh, that at first when it was put to me by the by the board and by our scientific advisory board and and, and our CEO uh, Debbie Brooks, who's a genius, um, I, I I kind of blanched and and then and then it made perfect sense to me, which is to de-risk for the drug companies, to go to a multi-billion dollar drug company that you know has a compound that, that potentially could be a therapy for, for Parkinson's, and they, they, they're not paying any attention to it because there's a million people with Parkinson's in, in the country, and that's not a lot. Uh, and, and five billion, uh, I don't know how many million, we'll watch six, seven, seven million, uh, which isn't a big market for, for a drug company to invest a lot of money in, 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 in working on a compound, that, targeting a compound that could be uh, potentially uh, therapeutic or, or curative for Parkinson's disease. So if we go to them and say, we'll give you $5 million to, to, to do the research, to do the, the, just identify if this is a reasonable, viable target, and we'll take it from there. And, 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 and that's worked out. We've done that. And what's happened in a lot of cases is another company with more money will come in and buy them out 
and it, and it just blows up exponentially the amount of research being done. So we've, we've really used the drug company's uh, trepidation and, 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 and somewhat, uh, la not lazy affair, but, but relaxed attitude towards the potential profits and, and Parkinson's to, 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 to do the work. And, and then to see relationships of the companies grow is, is, is that gets recognized and, and expanded on. And um, I think that we've had a lot of support uh, reaching out to, to, to the community in, in di different ways, whether it's promote clinical trials or so to get people to be involved in, in, in our, uh, our, we were doing this one trial called, uh, 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 it's gone out of my head. But, but basically what, what it's about is to find out if there's a, if there's a genetic marker for Parkinson's. And, and, and therefore, if, if we can find a common genetic marker, just, just whether it's a, a, something in the blood or something in the genes, or, or something in, in, in uh, behaviorally that, that we can identify and say that, that's definitely indicative of Parkinson's, we can identify what that is, what that marker is, then we can then target drugs and we can, we can research Parkinson's in a way that we can't now because by the time you're, 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 you're diagnosed, by the time you have physical, physical symptoms of Parkinson's, it's 80% of your dopamine producing cells are already gone. Mm -hmm. So if we can find a way to identify someone has Parkinson's before any evidence suggests that they do, um, we, can, we can really focus in on, on, on a cure. And we've had cooperation from drug companies all the way along in this, again, because we, we recognize from the outset that they're in, in, in it to make, make a profit. And we try to get them to, to, a lot of times we get them to share with, with other researchers that they're not, not inclined to do. Boy, this is crazy. I think I got it now. But, um, but anyway, that, that, that's, a, that's a long answer to, to a good question. Uh, drug companies, we need them. And, and so we can, we can try to change them a little bit by, by adjusting our behavior towards them and what we expect from them and what we're willing to, to share with them. Uh, but what, what we're not going to do without them. So, uh, so we, we, have a, we have a careful piece. Hi, Mr. Fox. Um, my name is Kira, and I'm a senior at Pomona. Um, so you address the theme of optimism in your life, especially optimism in the face of chronic illness. And you've described yourself as an incurable optimist. Um, so my question is whether, based on your experience, do you consider optimism to be more of an innate, inflexible characteristic or something that's more malleable and subject to change? In other words, can a pessimist become an optimist? <laughs> well, I was thinking of like those little bear cubs, you know, and, and the mother's catching the fish, and, and the little bear cub's trying to catch the fish, and, and it keeps whacking at it, and, and, and it can't get one, and, and then the other bear cubs will walk away, and, and that one bear cub's still there, like, trying to whack the salmon down. That's, that's a neat, that's just, it's just who that guy is. And, and, and I, think, I think that the, that, that applies to, to optimism, too. I mean, I think you just have, I mean, I grew up with an Irish grandmother who used to tell me stories, and, and, uh, and just every day was great. And her, her last words were, ooh la la. <laughs> she, she sat down in the chair and she went, ooh la la, and had a heart attack. <laughs> and, and, um, and I just, I just always, always had that, that feeling, and, and I feel it, I just feel like, uh, you know, you, you throw a penny in, in, in the air a hundred times, at least 51 times it's gonna come up heads. Uh, it just, it just, it's just, to me, I, it's not that I'm, 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 I'm blind to, to, to the possibility, uh, uh, and, I, and I'm not reckless. And I'm not, and I don't put my family in jeopardy because I don't worry it'll be okay. It's just a, just a bear. <laughs> um, uh, it'll be okay. He'll be, we'll make friends. Um, I, 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 I'm a, I, I can be pra pragmatic and realistic too, but, but I, but I do believe in, uh, I do believe that, that, that if we, if we let it happen, it'll, it'll happen in the right way. Most times, and the times it doesn't, it makes you grateful for the times that it does. Uh, it's really simple thinking, but I'm a simple guy, and and it works for me.
Hello. Um, my name is Teague. I'm a first year here at Pomona. And um, it seems like your family has been such an integral part of your happiness. And that doesn't seem to always be the case in Hollywood. So what makes your priorities different? We live in New York. <laughs> I, um, I actually thought when, 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 when our kids were born, we, we moved to, to New York. When my son was born, we moved to New York. And then, kind of, and then my daughters were, were all born there. And it's not that LA is a terrible place. LA is a great place. I was here from the 80s, and, and trust me, they were great. <laughs> I, I did LA all the way <laughs> and really had a good time. But um, I, didn't, I frankly didn't trust myself to raise kids in LA. I didn't trust myself to, to be able to handle all the challenges that they'd meet there. And you might say, well, New York, how is that any different? It is different in a way. You're, you're more aware of where your kids are all the time. You're more aware of uh, that they make relationships in the neighborhood with the guys in the corner of the store and, and all that stuff that you, you just know in your little world, as big as Manhattan is, you have your, your, your little world and, and you, can, you, can, you know who their friends are. You, you see them when you go to pick up at the end of the school day and, and uh, you, you get to know the parents. And it just, it just, it's a simpler, it's a simpler uh, life in a way. I mean, it's still complicated and all the big complications of living in a big city, but but it's just, um, I just, I just felt I knew my kids at every stage. And then I feel like in LA, if they could drift away in people's cars and go places I don't know where they're going. And, and I don't, and I've, I've lost touch, I've lost that contact. I just want to be able to uh, send my kid a smile and get a smile back. And, and, and that's all I need. And, and, I, and I, if, I, if, I, if I lose track of them for a second, uh, I feel less in danger, so I, that's why I didn't trust myself to raise kids in LA. But a lot of people I know have done it and done a good job. Um, I just don't, wouldn't wouldn't have been one of them. Hi, Marty. I mean, Michael J. Fox. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Samantha. I'm a first year at Pomona, and I wanted to ask if you could talk a little bit more about how you go about separating who you are personally and professionally from the disease with which you're living. Well, one of the first things that I, that I think about when you ask that question is that, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm honest with myself. When I take medication, and for example, right now in front of you, I'm fairly calm. I mean, I hope I haven't been too distracting to watch. Um, in, in, in that, but that's not my natural state. This is an artificial state. The, my natural state is to be just to be curled up and frozen and, and, and somewhat tremoring. And at this stage. Uh, I'd be more into freezing and, and tremoring. Um, and I'd have a hard time talking. I'd have a hard time organizing my thoughts. And, and it's kind of like you have a schnauzer on your pant leg. I mean, it's just like, he's just going all the time. And that's, that's my natural state. So I'm grateful for every moment that I get a relief from that. And, and, and when I can't get relief from that, and I'm in my other, that other state, that natural state, I try to understand it for what it is and, and just, and just uh, accept it. And as far as work goes, uh, and in, in, in separating myself as an actor from it, I, I joked earlier, I can play anybody as long as you got Parkinson's, which is true and to an extent because I can't, I can't uh, change the way my body is responding to, to the level of dopamine in my head at that moment. I mean, I can, I, can, I can influence it over time with medication, but I have to be careful how I take it. So it can be quite frustrating. So I just try to work that into what I'm doing. And I, I, did, a, I did an episode of a friend's show, uh, Rescue Me, that, that uh, my friend Dennis Leary d did. And I played it. He called me up, I should say. He called me and said, I got a great part for you in the show. I want you to do the show. And I said, what, what is it? And he said, he's, he's a pill-popping, misogynistic, alcoholic, uh, sex maniac. And I said, what, 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 what did you think of me? <laughs> and I said, on top of that, you know, and he said, he said he's a paraplegic. And I said, on top of that, he's a paraplegic. He's in a wheelchair. He can't, he can't move. And I, I don't know if you noticed, I can't stop moving. <laughs> I'm a human whirly gig. And, and he said, I know, it'd be great. <laughs> so I, 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 and then with the, the good wife, it's the same thing, too. I, I love that because I can't even say, we want you to play a guy 
who ha is a lawyer and he has Parkinson's or tardive dyskinesia, which is uh, a version of Parkinson's, and uh, and he uses it to manipulate the jury. And he uses it to ma manipulate people's feelings to get what he needs to get done. And I thought that's really cool <laughs> <laughs> because a lot of time, I mean, people with handicaps don't get to play assholes. They, 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 I mean, they, they get the soft piano music playing in the background, and, 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 and it's like all gauzy lensed, and, and, and we're, we're supposed to be uplifted or made to feel crappy or whatever. But you just have a guy who's just a regular jerk who, 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 who manipulates people's sympathies and plays on people's fears. Um, it, it's been a really fun experience. So I never would have been open to any of that if, I, if this wasn't my path. And, and I'm, I really would have missed those experiences. And, and I don't think, I mean, I would have maybe uh, just been, uh, been that guy who's on, on, back, on Back to the Future, but, uh, but I'm, I'm an actor who's working and doing work that, that gets seen, and, and it's a tremendous privilege. And I, uh, I, I'm not gonna let Parkinson's take that away from me, I, but rather have it serve me. Desert air is dry. <laughs> right, it is a little hot. Hi, so I'm Gooey. I'm a senior at Pomona. And I just wanted to say, in addition to the Back to the Future films, I also really enjoyed your performances, Milo Thatch in Atlantis. Uh -huh. yeah, so much to the point I wanted to be Milo Thatch when I was a kid. <laughs> so I wore my glasses today. Anyways, um, so my question is, in what ways do you think being a public figure both enhances and mitigates the effects of stigma against those living with Parkinson's? Mm -hmm. Well, when I first was diagnosed, like I said, I, I was, uh, I, when I first disclosed that I had, I had been diagnosed publicly, I, I, I let it out and, and I was feeling like, what did I do? You know, I, I mean, I, I, I told, I had an interview with Barbara Walters and I, and I had an interview with People Magazine. And if you ever want to get a secret out, call Barbara Walters and People Magazine because it will get out there. <laughs> And so all of a sudden I'm being overwhelmed with people calling and sympathy and uh, you're gonna die and uh, just all this stuff and I was, it was too much for me. So I, I went online and I found a Parkinson's chat room and I saw people with Parkinson's talking about it because it obviously affected their, their world and, and in a way that I didn't appreciate until I started to read what they were saying and I wonder what meds he's on, I wonder if he's on this, I wonder if he's on that, what does he know about this and, and, and the genuine concern for me at the same time, there was a certain amount of yippee. Like, this is great. And I understood that. They, 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 they sensed that maybe some light was gonna be shown on them and, and on their situation. And, and I considered that really carefully and I thought, well, I mean, beyond what I can do for them, this is a community that, that, that I can be a part of. And, I, and I, can, I can feel, as much as my wife and my kids loved me and supported me and were great to me, there's something about that thing of um, experience with another person who, I mean, I can see someone across an airport twitch a hand, and I'll go up to them and say, how you doing? Mm -hmm. And, 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 they'll, and they'll, they'll see me and they'll know that I know, and, and, and it's just, it's, it's, it's that in tune, and it's that, and it's that important to have that connection. And I thought, boy, if you don't, I mean, forget about what people might say, that you're being a poster boy or whatever, I mean, all that's just talk. It's just cynical talk. If, if, if I'm really mean to, 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 to take what I, I've, I've been given and, and, and help improve this, this community's, the life of this community uh, and, and potentially people beyond that, um, I, I, I'd be a fool not to. I'd, I'd really be, I'd really be uh, uh, doing all of us a disservice. And so I had to think carefully about how I went ahead with that. But, uh, uh, there, was a, there was a lady who wrote a letter and she said she, she used to go to the store all the time and the cashier would give her funny looks because she'd be struggling to get the change. So sometimes really simple things like shifting in a chair or something is really hard for people with Parkinson's and little manipulations and transacting things are not hard. I don't, I, I always, when I'm with my kids or something, I'll, if I'm buying something, I'll say, you can have it as long as you do the transaction. I, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to transact. I don't wanna, and, and, and um, 
so this woman said that she I was had a thing, and then and then one day she came in and, and the guy actually spoke to her and said, Do you have Parkinson's? And she said, Yeah, I do. And he said, just like Michael Fox. <laughs> and and I, I, I thought, wow, that's really that's really cool. That's really that's bigger than anything I've done before. Because it, it wasn't it wasn't my idea and I'm not ascribing it to I'm not saying like I was chosen, I was supposed to do this. It was meant to happen. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not in some of my departments above my pay grade. But I do know that it's, 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 it's been a great, a great uh, privilege to, to be able to do this work. And, and, uh, and I'm really grateful to all the people that do, do it with me. I think we have one or two. Hi, Mr. Fox. Uh, my name is Josh. I'm a junior at Pomona College, and it, uh, it seems you already answered the question that I had planned, so... I'll make him um, another answer. <laughs> <laughs> Would you rather that? I also have another question that I could Go ask ahead, you. ask me another question. The other question? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, this is kind of a, a loaded question. I don't know how I would I knew it would be. This. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, what's the happiest moment of your life so far? Oh, wow. It's, it's, I mean, the obvious thing is the birth of my kids and all of them were amazing. Um, and I think the, uh, the happiest moment... Uh, I think, I, I, think I, I didn't know if the time was the happiest moment, but it was like the best thing that ever happened to me, I think, it was... was uh, well, again, this relates to my family, but when uh, Tracy was doing Family Ties, and she and she, uh, we we become friends, but we weren't seeing each other, and 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 I was just this party maniac. I was literally the boy prince of Hollywood and just digging it, <laughs> and I was a mess. I was all over. I had I had five cars. I had a Ferrari and a Mercedes and a Range Rover, and it was just it was just stupid. It was just like the book of stupid Hollywood, stupid. And, and, and she um, I walked out to the parking lot one day, and it was her last day of work. And um, she, she said, I, I want to play something. And my, my car radio, so I got out of my Ferrari and walked over to her rented Volkswagen Rabbit. <laughs> and she played me this James Taylor song called That's Why I'm Here. Um, about, about, it's extensively about John Belushi dying, but, but it was just about being grateful for being here. And she said, you, you, you're killing yourself. And, and you, 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 you want to think about why you're here and what, what, what you want to do here. And, um, and we didn't start going out for another six months or seven months after that when, when she auditioned for, for Bright Lights Big City. But that began, it took a long time for the wheels to turn for me to completely become a, not an idiot. But uh, but that that moment I look back at it, and that moment changed my life, and and, uh, and uh, I mean from instantly from that point I was in love with her. But I, it took me a long time to get that across. <laughs> but, I think we have one last great. question for you. Hi, Mr. Day Fox. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm Molly, and I'm a senior at Pomona, and I was wondering. If you were a superhero, what would your superhero power be? And if you wore a cape, what color would it be? <laughs> well, uh, what kind of superhero would I be? Ant-Man's taken. <laughs> um, I'd be, I'd be, uh, I'm trying to figure this, this is cool. Hopefully I'll think of something before you all get bored. Um, I, I, I I think I'd be... I, I don't think dogs have a superhero. Like a superhero for dogs. It goes and looks after dogs and rescues dogs that are, that are, that are in peril. I think, I, I think I'd be that. And, and my, 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 uh, my cape would be... Uh, for, like, linty... Fur nappy, white with blue, yellow, and brown spots. (laughs) 
Here I come to save the day. Is that it for the students? All right, so we're going to close with just one quote that I wanted to read you. And I'm actually really excited that I get to read this quote because we didn't get to talk much about faith, almost at all. Um, but in one of your books, you said, and since I am not sure of the address to which to send my gratitude, I put it out there in everything I do. And so I want to take this moment and please allow us to show you our gratitude for everything that you've put out there. Thank you so much, Michael Bicca. Thanks, Josh.